Hi everyone, we're at the Actuaries Summit 2019 and we're so lucky to have Dr. Carl here with us. How are you feeling about presenting to Actuaries today? Um, I'm out of my range of knowledge because you guys know things that I don't know, but you guys have told us two very important things. One, that if you smoke cigarettes, that it's bad for your health and you die sooner. And you guys discovered that before the doctors. And secondly, you picked up climate change by Munich Re in 1974, beginning to factor into their insurance premiums before the scientists had uh, enough proof to show that it was real. Big it up for you guys. How do you manage to talk so quickly? You got so much in in that, was it half an hour session? Well, uh, firstly, it was a, um, one hour session content and I, I shortened it down, left a, lot of, left a lot of stuff out. The trouble with talking quickly um, and succinctly is that that's wrong. You see, you can have high density of information when it's written because you can stop and go back. But when it's spoken, you've deliberately got to speak with uh, slower and with uh, redundancy. And I had to disobey both those rules to get the information through to give you enough of a worthy input because I would have felt I was cheating you otherwise not to give you what I gave you and I barely touched upon the Flynn effect that the students uh, 9 IQ points, each generation is 9 IQ points smarter than their parents and I barely touched upon the fact that we're living in the most peaceful time ever in the history of the human race other than to say it on a slide. Yeah. I had to, I'm that sorry. That's really interesting, I really wanted to know more. Well, pick one. Okay, over to you. You're running this interview. <laughs> yes, what new research and development in science and technology perhaps inspired or influenced your presentation today? Um, all of it. Uh, I have 16 years of university education for free, thank you taxpayers of Australia. And then secondly, I read my way through $10,000 worth of scientific literature every year, which covers all of that. And then thirdly, that would all be just a mess floating in my brain, except for the fact that I write four stories every week. And so I write four stories, and after a couple of years or decades, you begin to build up a body of knowledge in your head that you know is accurate and relevant, as opposed to Everest is two kilometres high, or is it 20? I forget. You, know, you, there's all, you don't have this fuzzy stuff floating around your head. You've got a well-defined body of knowledge that's interlinked. So that's where I get my knowledge from, by reading my way through the literature. So as I read my way through that literature, I find all sorts of stuff that will influence where our landscape will be in 20 years from now. Landscape meaning the world, and that covers stuff like engineering and hard science and genetics and um, artificial intelligence and the environment. So that's where I get my information from, by reading the scientific literature and then turning it into stories. So then I apply time and after a while I think, oh, okay, that bit's important, that's not. Yeah, sure. Great. So actuaries are long-term focused. You said you like that. And you did mention that one thing you hope they take away is China's moonshot, that they yeah. aimed to be the greenest nation on earth. Was there anything else that you hope that they take away and why did you mention that one specifically as well? Well, China has four moonshots and the thing I like about China and actuaries is they both seem to have long-term views. So if you look at the United States, every single president in the last 30 years has said, we're going to go to the moon, we're going to go to Mars and then proceeded not to give any money for it. So there's no long-term view. Um, for better or for worse, China learned a lot from Tiananmen Square. Uh, a colleague of mine told me this story that he was walking across the road in Shanghai. He was going against a red light. By the time he got to the other side of the street, a message came up on his phone that he'd already been fined. So they did a combination of face recognition and then geolocating via his phone and then send him the fine. That's a bit scary. Well, that's where China is heading and they're going for a long-term view with regard to social credit and keeping the citizens in line. But they're covering a whole lot of stuff, but it's all long-term. And there are lessons to be got by looking at China, whether you follow that or not, is different from looking at what they're doing and then seeing what happens and then learning from their mistakes. Yeah. That, that, that I think is the advantage of looking at China to see what they do and why and is that a good pathway for us or not. Yeah. So actuaries are experts at managing risk mm. and looking at patterns in the data and um, relating that to business outcomes. Yep. So what is it do you think that the actuary can bring right now in these sort of challenges? 
the greatest advantage that actuaries have is access to lots of data from the past and the ability to analyse it in a way that's relevant for the society today. The short term small goal is that they make money and they have a profit and they stay in business over the next few generations, but long term they're giving us a snapshot of our society day by day, month by month, year by year, decade by decade, going back over generations. So they were the ones who said, you smoke cigarettes, we're going to charge you more for a life insurance premium. Nothing personal, no, it's just business. And they're the ones who, with regard to climate change, can see it appearing on their insurance premiums that they have to pay out. The situation we have with climate change is that it has been deliberately politicised by the big fossil fuel companies. So in 1974-ish, Munich Re started seeing it appearing in higher insurance premiums. The scientists had a higher burden of proof, took them until 1989. Not much happened between 1989 and 1991, except that, secretly, behind the scenes, the big fossil fuel companies were talking among themselves as to what to do. We have this from the emails from Exxon especially in the New York Times. Go to New York Times and look up Exxon emails and read it and weep. And so over a two year period, they said back and forwards among themselves, look, this, glo this global warming stuff, the, the uh, greenhouse effect is real. Uh, what are we gonna do about it? Option one, um, acknowledge that it's real, work towards mitigating it, being good corporate citizens, and try at the same time to make a profit, which is hard if you no longer have the same BAU or business as usual model because you're going into a different model. Mm. Option two, keep business as usual and fund a massive disinformation campaign, which they did beginning in 1991 and have kept on doing so. Read about this in the book Merchants of Doubt by Naomi Oreskes. And so you end up with various irrationalities around the world. So in the United Kingdom, the Conservative Party because they want to conserve what is best about English society, they accept the science of climate change, but the non-conservative party denies it. And in, the Australia, in Australia, for different reasons, it's the other way around. The mind boggles. So, but the point is that regardless of whether you say that it's real or not, it is real. Yeah. And so the accountants, the actuaries, the, the people who deal with the numbers yeah. and who see the costs, they're the people who are telling us that it's real. And for, I have no idea why we do not follow their advice. They, uh, maybe it's as irrational as saying that the Great Barrier Reef is in perfect condition, according to the statement by the Minister for the Environment recently. Yeah. And you have heard of the actuaries, Australian Actuaries Climate Index, haven't you? No, I have not. Assume I know nothing. Tell me about it. OK, I will have to send you a link. It basically tracks weather uh, events, the frequency and severity ah. of weather events. Uh, so temperature, wind, um, rainfall, drought, yeah. the aim is to correlate that to risk in the future and translate that into financial risk mm -hmm. so that companies can then use it to look at their risk. And it's um, it's getting some good coverage, it's been in the, really? the ABC, yeah. Oh well send it to me, just yeah. this morning for example, there was a vast loss of income uh, in that uh, due to the extreme weather event that just hit Sydney, we had three centimetres of snow in the Blue Mountains. So we had the combination of the road being making electricity yeah. and carbon generation. And then the schools were shut. And so that, ha that, that also should be factored into the price of making electricity. Yeah, absolutely. When you start to pay attention to those costs, you really you realise yeah. how important it is. So I think the most important thing is that if we have politicians who refuse to face the facts, and you guys should become politicians. I ran for politics myself in 2007. Well, um, we couldn't afford it uh, because for a quarter of a million dollars, uh, you don't get a lot. Um, for $5,000, you get a 30 second advertisement on TV um, at the unattractive time of 3 a.m. on a Sunday morning after the ads for the abdominizer, the non stick fry pan, and these amazing <laughs> knives that stay sharp even if you cut a shoe with them, but before the born again fundamentalist gun toting redneck Christians from right. uh, Texas and uh, Australia. And so not many people saw the ads. Mm. So uh, the thing I learned from that is the best thing the politicians have done, number one, the best thing the politicians have done is to put out a vibe that when you say to somebody, I want to go become a politician, they say, oh no, I wouldn't do that. They have succeeded. They have succeeded 
because you think that you won't do it, so they'll stay in their job and you won't boot them out. If the polit that, yeah, if, if, the, if your automatic reflex is to say, oh no, I don't want to become a politician, you are passing up the opportunity to do good. You see, Chairman Mao said, power grows out of the barrel of a gun, which it does in some parts of the world, but in Australia, power grows out of politics. It grows out of the parliament. That's where the power is. I have no power. I tried to have power by running for parliament, didn't have any. I have influence, I don't have any power. So run for politics, because that's where you can change the world, and maybe have National Actuarial Day uh, bring that in as an act of parliament, the, the yeah. first Sunday, first day of every month, a pinch and a punch for the actuaries. And, and, um, I like it. Yeah, yeah. And, and you can and only say facts on that day. You can, you, you, can, you, can, you can tell only truth on that day. You said we're living in the most peaceful time in human history. Let's start on peaceful. Sure. So firstly, we are living in the most peaceful time ever in the history of the human race. And the books to read are, firstly, Factfulness, by Hans Rosling, R-O-S-L-I-N-G, and two, The Better Angels of Our Nature by Steven Pinker. They both look at the big scale, wars, and the small scale, individual. On a big scale, people have said, wrongly, that the Second World War was the most bloody war ever in the history of the human race. No, in the year 755, to put down the An Lushan Revolt in China, the Emperor of China killed one in every six humans alive. He killed one in every three people in China. Genghis Khan, whose DNA I have, he had the world's largest land empire, and in the 13th century, he killed one in every nine people. Second World War, one in every 44. Still bad, but heading in the right direction. And if you look at the small scale, um, such as murder against citizens, violence against citizens, um, judicial torture, uh, you know, there's only one nation now left on earth where it is legal under the law of that nation to torture somebody, get a confession, and then use that confession to convict them and put them in jail. And so that's getting better. And also slavery. So on the big scale and the small scale, everything's getting better. Yeah. And so you think, but hang on, I kind of think that everything's really bad. And the answer lies in the five word motto of the media for which I used to work for many years. And the five word motto is, if it bleeds, it leads. If you've got a school library being built or a car accident outside the school library, you do a story about the bleeding thing. Yes. So that's the first thing that we're heading down the pathway of the world is getting better, even though we don't think it is. And that was the second part of your question. The, news. So the second part of your question. How would you describe the future of technology? Ah, okay. This and is not so much technology, and so you want to read the book The Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse by Schindler. Okay. And on one hand, it is good to have peace. I like peace because you don't have wars. Uh, I've been in Afghanistan with the Australian military. Um, I don't like wars. Uh, good people die for no reason. But, and so you think peace is good, and peace is good. Also, read um, Capitalism in the 21st Century by Thomas Piketty. Okay. And in both of those books, Horseman by Schindler and Capitalism by Piketty, they say that the longer the period of peace, the more the inequality. So immediately after a, after a war, after the society's been reset, everybody's pretty well stuffed and all, everybody's just trying to survive. But the longer the period of peace, for whatever reason, some people will then move ahead and they will adjust the laws of their country so they can get wealthier at other people's expense. And so then you begin to have people living, earning income, not by working, but by investments. And then they juggle the books to go even more that way. And so if you go back to the Oxfam report about world inequality, in the year 2010, it took 343 billionaires to have the same combined wealth as the bottom three and a half poorest people on the planet. And by 2017, it had dropped to eight, all of them white and all of them male. Little diversion now. How come they're both cubes? 343 is 7 cubed and 8 is <laughs> 2 cubed. Ask the actuaries. Yeah, ask the actuaries. They know. If you act actuaries, tell me why they're both cubes. So the four horsemen that reset the clock on economic inequality are pestilence, plague, and war, and collapse of the state, and revolution. And there, unfortunately, each of those involves lots of dead people. There has to be a fifth way that does not involve dead people. That's a complicated answer to your question. Yeah. Sorry. That's okay. It's not an easy answer.
but that's left us. I had to read so many books too. Yeah, well, we've got a great li reading list out of that answer. Anyway. Okay, <laughs> there, there will be an exam on that. Uh, we'll send around the multiple choice shortly. Might be even harder than the actuarial exams. <laughs> um, I think that's almost all we had for you, except what advice do you have for working professionals who want to embrace new technologies and the opportunities they present, but perhaps they're constricted in their workplace? Um, learn where you can. It doesn't matter whether it's the um, your kids who'll teach you how to use um, Facebook or Twitter or whatever you Twitter or whatever you call it. Um, You're on Twitter, aren't you? Yeah, a third of a million followers. are oh, shucks. Oh, stop it. Yeah, oh, shucks. <laughs> um, so, uh, so just embrace it, bearing in mind that it's not always the best. So um, I had a bit of a, an amazing insight when I was working as a physicist at the Steelworks. And I saw them make a railway wheel. Now, a wheel for a railway, railway carriage is a big thing about sort of so big yeah. and it's made of steel. Yeah. Um, and it's about this thick and you know, this, this high can be even higher. And they're good for over a million kilometres. And um, they were making them by getting what they called a biscuit. And a yeah. biscuit is a lump of steel about this by this by that and it's red hot and you put it under a press and the press goes bang, bang, bang and suddenly you've got this railway wheel and you just do a bit of machining and there you've got something that's good for a million or more kilometres. And um, I couldn't work out what was bothering me and it took me a few days to realise that the wheel is perfect for its application. Yeah. And so you don't make the wheel better by making it hexagonal or octagonal. Constant diameter round is the best. And in the same way, um, some of the new technologies might not be better and some it's of the old... Broke. If it's not broke, don't fix yeah. it. Yeah, it's, it's good to know it, uh, to see if it's better and learn what you can from it, but don't necessarily think, oh my God, I've spent all this time learning how to use Python or Twitter or Facebook, therefore I'll go and use it. Uh, it's hard, but then you, you know about sunk cost and opportunity cost and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. So um, just bite the bullet and say, I reckon that it's no good, but I'll learn, learn from using it. Yeah. On the other hand, it's kind of a dumb thing to say because you had that um, Lance Armstrong guy, the uh, cheating cyclist who had test Tour de France, who used all sorts of drugs and lied about it. And after he brought the name of the uh, industry, of the whole Tour de France into disrepute and had ruined the lives of many people in a TV interview, he said, well, at least I learned something from it. So I don't think that just learning something from it is not always a good, is good enough to destroy people's lives. No, I <laughs> think that's a good point. All right, Dr. Carl, it was so amazing to talk to you and thank you so much for presenting at the Actuary Summit. Thank you very much. And, and big it up to you guys for working it out about both climate change and cigarette smoking before the medicos and the climate scientists did. Big it up for you guys. You rock.